Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the January 24th, 2022 Park Board meeting. Could everybody please remember to mute yourselves when you're not speaking? Thanks. Sorry, Brad. Yeah, getting a little echo there. So with that, uh, first thing I wanted to do is roll call. So when I call your name, please take yourself off mute and let us know you're here. Uh, Danielle. Here. Uh, Zach. Here. Chris. Here. Uh, Ruben. Here. Uh, Linda. Here. And Brenda. Good. Thank you, everyone, for that. Uh, next on the item for our agenda this evening is uh, approval of minutes. And uh, everyone had a chance to take a look at them, I assume. Anybody have any comments or corrections that you're aware of? Uh, the only addendum, I guess, that I would like to add, Melissa, is uh, to uh add uh ryan and sean as two people from the youth board that uh, were in attendance uh, i did not see them listed um, as attendees great i'll do that thank you brad any other corrections or comments any objections to approval of minutes seeing no objections i hereby approve minutes from our november 22nd meeting thank you everyone for that uh, next on the agenda, Melissa, do we have any public comments from anyone? No public comments received, and we do not have any um, guest attendees this evening. Okay, thank you. So we have three uh, main items on the agenda this evening. Uh, work plan for 2022. Uh, we're going to be talking further again about the capital task force. Um, uh, capital finance task force, I should say, and we're also going to have some further discussion and an action item for the Newport way letter, which was included in your packet. Uh, so, with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Jeff and Jennifer to start uh, the discussion about the work plan for 2022. That's great. Thanks, Brad. Good evening, everybody. Uh, Jeff Watling, uh, Parks and Community Services Director. Yeah, this first item is um, something we've done the last uh, couple of years now um, as a bit of a tradition where we go over um, not, a, not the entire work plan of the department, but uh, sort of those major work plan items um, Typically, uh, we've gone over this as sort of our one pager word document. Um, I sent that uh, to you later this afternoon. We'll be sure to add that to the minutes. Um, but uh, rather we thought tonight we'd spend a little extra time on uh, these items. Um, and so we will um, switch over to a PowerPoint presentation um, and have um, us sort of go through these uh, projects. Um, our department uh, is comprised of five divisions, as you recall, uh, park planning and administration, park operations, uh, recreation services team, um, arts and human services. Uh, for the purposes of the presentation and sort of our discussion and, and feedback tonight, we're gonna spend our time highlighting the park planning projects, the capital projects, our park operation initiatives and our recreation initiatives. Um, given that the arts initiatives are, are really um, 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 focused um, um, and advised uh, with the arts commission and equally so the human services items with the human services commission. So um, why don't we pull up the PowerPoint presentation? Um, Brian, if you're able to, to do that, that would be. Let me give it a go. Great, thank you. Wow, did that come up? Looking good. You know, it's 
funny is I can't see it. Oh, man, I guess I got it on my other screen here. Is it good enough? I'm not seeing how you're seeing it, but is it good enough as it is? I can just scroll through the uh, sheets or how are you seeing it? Uh, we're seeing it with uh, the preview on the side. Um, I don't know if there's a way to just make it single screen. I think present. Yeah. Perfect. That looks great. Thanks, Brian. Yeah. How many parks and rec officials does it take to equate to one IT person? Um, <laughs> it's all good. Uh, oh, next yeah. <laughs> three, three, Brad, the over under is three, apparently. Thank you for that. Um, next slide, Brian. Oh. So, as I mentioned before, uh, this work plan is, is really focusing on our major work plan items. It's not intended as our all inclusive work plan. There's a lot of operational work. A lot of program and service delivery that is not highlighted here. This is really representing within each division that significant work that's going to have a degree of public engagement um, with the community um, and or um, uh, interaction uh, with city council. Um, uh, and as I mentioned before, we're going to highlight the park planning, park operations and recreation items tonight. And uh, as we go through it, uh, Jennifer and Brian are going to help uh, with their respective uh, divisions. And in, in, again, just giving a, a highlight of, of where we're at with these projects and, and uh, what they're about and would certainly welcome um, any feedback, discussion, questions um, at the end. Next slide. And I think we'll kick off our, our capital projects. So Jennifer Fink, our park, uh, park project manager, take it away. Thank you, Jeff. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, Jennifer Fink, park planner, project administrator here to chat about a variety of park projects, all in various stages of development and action and look forward to sharing that with you. Um, one that has um, been hot on the list in 2021 um, and we're going to be working on through 2022 is Hillside Neighborhood Park. As the board recalls, um, we had a surprise uh, discovery as we were doing some design work out on the site that the ball field um, is actually a wetland. After much work with the community and the neighborhood, um, it was recommended that we mitigate that. And so before we can do any park improvements, we need to learn more about how to drain the wetland. And so currently we're doing some geotechnical work on the play field. Um, the field work has been completed, but they are now working on our final report so we can have some uh, guidance and direction as to how we can drain the play field in order to make it usable year round for the community. Um, in doing um, mitigation for the existing wetland, we need to find sites for um, enhancement or improvement of an existing wetland. And so we've been um, doing some field work uh, this winter to try and identify what would be a good candidate um, given the sites we are there's no recommendation at this time um we need to also understand what potential play improvements would be to the wetlands we understand the level of impact that we would be having um, on that would require mitigation so we're doing a little back and forth once we get the geotechnical work with design in order to um, move the project forward and make a full recommendation on sites there's a we're using a number of um, components and uh, checklist priorities in order to find the proper suitable site. So much more to come on that as we work through that process. Um, we do plan on re-engaging the neighborhood and um, updating them on developments with the mitigation and, and also identifying any future park improvements uh, late in Q1 of this year. Next slide. Blackberry Park, this was another exciting um, project that started in 2021. Um, along with Hillside Park, Blackberry Park is also in need of some play area improvements. And after working um, with the community on this park, um, we were able to come up with a new uh, preferred design. 
and we have taken that into construction documents and are currently in the permitting process with the city. Um, we are working on getting this project bid and we hope to start construction in spring or early summer of this year. So this will be about a three to four month uh, construction project, but look really forward to bringing this to the community um, as this park is somewhat dated, but highly loved. And so I know the neighborhood be very, very excited uh, for these park improvements. Next slide. Wayfinding, um, we have been working on a citywide um, wayfinding plan that also includes park and trail and facility signage. Uh, we are hoping with the 2022 budget, there is money to begin implementation. Um, as we finish out our design process, um, we are also creating a master plan with um, design details for each of these sign types. And with that, we will be creating some prototypes. And we'll be sharing those with the community um, this year and uh, hope to get feedback. Uh, we hope to have the prototypes and uh, some community feedback, hopefully in Q2 of this year, um, assuming with uh, uh, supply chain issues and all of that, we can still get them um, fabricated in that time frame. Um, we hope to have the master plan completed here um, probably Q2, and then we hope to start initial um, installations in Q4. We have, we're gonna be doing a few facilities, a few of the newer parks like Hillside Park and Blackberry Park as part of those park improvements, and also some signage along the Rainier Trail. Next. Another project that actually started back in 2019, pre-pandemic. <laughs> as the uh, Anchor Parks project. So we were doing Tibbetts Valley Park, Veterans Memorial, and the Creek Corridor all as one um, comprehensive project. And we are have now split those up into three, as you may recall. Just before the pandemic broke, we were about ready to send out a survey um, to the community on Tibbetts Valley Park, Veterans, and the Creek Corridor. And um, that has been on pause. We are now, um, as part of reviving these projects, we also um, got together some focus groups and we had some significant conversation and we reviewed our existing concepts and looked at how um, they needed to be improved given what we'd learned through the pandemic, through public use of park spaces. As we know, um, parks became a safe haven during the pandemic for individuals and areas down and around um, Veterans Memorial were used very differently with the streetery and public access and using trails and being able to use our park system for mental health uh, during this challenging time. And so as we're uh, reviving this, we hope to kick off in Q1 of this year, um, Veterans Memorial Field through our focus group uh, conversations that really felt Veterans uh, Memorial Field was probably the ripest for um, it was, we looked at all projects, which to start with first, um, they felt it had the most sense of urgency to begin with that. And so um, we hope to, then as soon as we get that one going and out the gate, we'll roll into Chibbets Valley Park as well. But these parks are really our anchors within our park system here to serve not only residents of today, but the future and really looking at all the demands that these park spaces need to provide and uh, with multiple benefits. So a lot more to come on these projects um, this year. So I look forward to the board's involvement with that. Next. Um, as part of our parks capital project too, we're also um, embarking upon a sports field inventory and needs assessment. Um, we are gonna be working with a consultant finalizing a scope of work right now. Um, hope to get them underway here and start engagement uh, on this with the sports teams, maybe late in Q1, and hope to have this project completed in late Q2. As part of this, we want to better understand some of our field uses and demands, but also what um, potential improvements could be had at those. As part of this, we are taking a look at all 
athletic fields within the citywide system that includes um, fields at Lake Sammamish State Park and any Issaquah School District fields that would be within um, the city limits only. Next slide. Um, another thing uh, that's rolling these days and work with um, a lot of folks from different people are the uh, capital financing task work, which is really um, a collaboration um, looking at all the different um, funding needs throughout the city and um, what we can do to help support and get um, the improvements needed, not only here in the park system, but also with transportation and other citywide needs. Um, looks like um, there's gonna be more coming out here in the near future with recommendations from this uh, group here in um, Q1 of this year. So more to come on that. And I know there's a topic on the agenda tonight, so I'll keep it short on that. Um, as Parks capital uh, projects, we know that um, park needs um, as far as open space and strategic acquisitions are really um, important and have always been on our work plan. And we will continue with that work um, this year, whether it's fulfilling acquisitions for um, Squaw Creek Watersway and um, future uh, con connectivity needs. Um, we are always looking um, for strategic and opportunities when they do arise. We also are um, rolling in our second year of the off-leash dog area. Um, tour number two is underway for 22. Um, right now it is at the community center, but February 1st we'll be moving to Squawk Valley Park. Again, we received some wonderful feedback from the community about how they enjoyed um, the use of this uh, off leash area, though it has been temporary, uh, we're still looking at trying to create a permanent facility, but we hope later at Q2 of this year to get some more public feedback uh, to really determine what our next steps are gonna be for 2023 with that, knowing um, the original site of the off leash facility due to the delays from the pandemic and the Tibbetts Valley Park master planning are going to be delayed. So. Look forward to more conversations on that. All right, Jen, thanks so much for, for that overview. Certainly a lot on the uh, parks admin park planning front. Um, uh, I'll cover the, the major work plan items here in park operations, these next couple of slides. Um, obviously, our, our park operations team, their, their primary focus is effective maintenance and stewardship of our parks, our trails, and our open space system. As I said earlier, uh, these initiatives over the next two slides are really additive and in addition to that uh, primary task of maintenance and stewardship. Uh, this first item, uh, we will be going through some recruitment and hiring. Um, unfortunately, uh, the tail end of, of last year, we, we lost some really key staff due to um, um, some non-disciplinary um, um, actions. Um, sorry, I, I, I can't get in, into too many details uh, in, in that regard, but um, it's meeting some, uh, some recruitment uh, within that group, both for the, the park operations manager position, as well as a number of maintenance worker two positions. Both of those recruitments are out. Uh, we're gonna be interviewing um, uh, some strong candidates uh, with, within park operations manager here uh, this week um, and um, maintenance worker two position um, openings uh, close here uh, next week. Um, and we'll begin those recruitment or those interviews um, in February. Uh, something we're doing with street landscaping, as you may know, a, a majority of the street landscaping maintenance is handled by uh, the park operations team. Um, as we've been spending a lot of time in these last couple of years, really becoming an intentional in, in where we want to focus our staff hours, our very limited staff hours. Uh, we're making a, a bit of a pivot this year and we're going to pilot um, consolidating all of that streetscape, street landscaping work into one consolidated contract. 
Um, that will, I think, allow us to more effectively manage uh, that, that singular contract for street landscaping. And then also at the same time, strategically allow us to focus our um, staff hours um, uh, within our properties, within our parks, within our open space and, and trail system um, that uh, continue to have certainly priority maintenance needs as well. Uh, so just a, a, a key um, step in trying to prioritize um, um, who does what um, in terms of, of stewardship. Uh, Green Issaquah um, and our um, initiative that looks at um, maintaining and stewarding our um, our urban forest um, in partnership with Forterra um, got into a got off to a really strong start last year with uh, multiple stewards uh, beginning their volunteer work. We anticipate and look forward to to continued growth as we head into 2022. Um, you should be able to anticipate. I'm hoping by our, our February Park Board meeting, uh, myself and Matt Meckler are working with Forterra. We should have our 2021 annual report uh, from Green Issaquah put together, and and would love to to share that with you um, as park board um, and some of the progress we made last year. Uh, Pickering Barn, um, we are going to be embarking on a, a some, um, more focused grounds maintenance planning uh, around that uh, barn in particular the landscaping around uh, that very, very iconic facility. Uh, we're seeking uh, really an outcome that gives us a much more sustainable um, and year round consistency uh, with the maintenance uh, the landscape maintenance um, around uh, around the barn. Next slide, Brian. A couple other uh, major work plan items within Park Ops. Um, the Confluence Park Bridge, uh, you see the photo there, um, our iconic bridge. We do have um, some artwork that was incorporated into the concrete decking, you may recall. Um, we've been working closely with uh, Amy Dukes and the arts uh, folks and the arts commission on um, dealing with a, a bit of a, a repair issue and that some of the, um, if you recall, there's some glass inlaid um, in, into the decking itself uh, for sort of a, a color and decorative um, um, component within the decking. Uh, some of that is coming loose and has been coming loose, so uh, we're embarking on some coordinated repairs of, of that work uh, this year. Uh, Going to do our next phase of tennis court resurfacing. We did some very successful resurfacing efforts last year at Tibbetts Valley Park. Um, you see the photo there uh, with the new, the new surfacing. We'll now be doing the same thing at Central Park and Blackberry Park this year. Uh, and then lastly, within Park Operations Team at Upper Hillside Cemetery, you may recall um, pre-pandemic, uh, we'd been begun doing some diagnostic work on parts of the Upper Hillside Cemetery where we've seen some um, 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 excessive water and, and um, um, sort of not good ground conditions. Uh, we are going to dig a little deeper, dust off some of that diagnostic work and uh, work with our um, uh, cemetery manager, uh, Flintoffs, uh, through our, our um, uh, management agreement with them and uh, work towards not only diagnosis, but uh, some solutions um, to that. Next slide, and I'm going to hand it over to our recreation manager, Brian Bernston. Brian, take it away. Hey, thank you, Jeff, and good evening, everybody. It's good to see a lot of you and, and to see some new faces. That's awesome. Uh, thank you for having me tonight. Once again, as Jeff said, I'm Brian Burson. I oversee the Recreation Services Division. Uh, for those that don't know, that would be the like the operations of the Community Center, the Julius Bone Pool, Issaquah Senior Center, and Pickering Barn. Um, we have the uh, first topic is the recruiting and hiring. We have uh, four positions, and just as a quick reminder, going into COVID, we had a reduction in workforce of 7.5 staff. So, you know, it seems like forever ago that that happened, right? And uh, we're excited that coming into 2022, we're going to get some of those positions coming back. Uh, one of those is a senior center supervisor. Um, down there, we're working with our seniors, much needed uh, position to just, you know, be able to give some full time, 40 hours a week, commitment to working with them. Um, we have two recreation leader positions that uh, are going to be coming back to us at the community center and at the Julius Bohm pool. And then we have uh, an administrative specialist position that will be coming to us at the community center. 
Um, we have the Julius Bohm pool feasibility study. This is, uh, I guess, this one gets me excited. This one's really sort of cool. Um, you know, our current demand exceeds our ability to meet uh, to meet it, right? And uh, for those that have been around long enough, I think we we all know that's been the statement that the pool has had for many many years. Um, we have, we we have one pool, and there's a lot of people that would love to see it uh, to be able to use it too. Um, because we support that that pool supports three local three high schools and one local swim team. It also runs a very robust learn to swim program. So there's there's a lot going on in that pool, and it serves not only the city of Issaquah, but it serves the Issaquah School District, which includes portions of Sammamish, Renton, Bellevue, and Newcastle. Um, when you know we heard that the Issaquah School District was considering uh, looking into a fourth high school, um, staff proactively approached the Issaquah School District to sort of talk to them about, you know, letting them know we, we, we all know that there's been sort of limited uh, aquatic facilities. And now with a new fourth high school and a new fourth swim team for boys and girls coming on board, we thought it would be a good time to begin discussions with them about, you know, what does our future maybe look like and what might, we might want to be a little on the front end of addressing those future aquatic needs. So, um, we began discussing with the school district. We've also applied now for a, uh, oh gosh, what's it called? I might have to look at my notes on that one. The King County Parks Levy Grant for funding to hire a consultant to conduct a feasibility study. That feasibility study would be to see what would it, what would it look like to increase the capacity of our existing pool? How might we go about increasing our current pool space? And then primarily probably looking at the um, existing site as a potential, you know, growth. Those that, uh, again, I'll tap some of those that have been around for a while. We did a pool feasibility, I think it was back in 2009. And some of those concepts included, what would it look like if we expanded the existing site? What could we do? How could we gain some more, you know, pool space for everybody to be able to use? So that, uh, that work's going to be coming to us here hopefully soon. Uh, we haven't been officially notified um, that we've received the grant, but uh, we're very hopeful and, and feel that it could be, we have a really high likelihood of receiving that. Um, the, oh, I guess I'll go to the next. Sorry, I'm multitasking here on my... Uh, I gotta remember to do my own slide. Uh, the Pickering Barn, HVAC, and the uh, this one, this one was one that for years we have had, you know, especially recently, right? We set records this last summer um, with 116 degrees. Um, having in the dairy barn, which is the big, long, rectangular portion of the Pickering Barn, having um, air conditioning in there will be, you know, and creating some uh, climate control will be much. Uh, appreciated by our renters. So we're looking forward to looking into that. Our, um, you know, cause it has heating, it just does not have air conditioning. Then on the barn side of the Pickering barn, it has, it does not have heating or air conditioning. So we will be looking at some options there too, of what might we be able to do to create that and make that a little bit more comfortable during those extreme hot and extreme cold days. So that'll be part of our assessment analysis as well. At our community center, we're looking at doing some uh, replacement of our cardiovascular equipment. Um, it's it's at the end of its life. It's it's ready to be replaced. So we're going to be picking up. Uh, where are we picking up? We're going to be picking up uh, four treadmills, two elliptical trainers, two recumbent bikes, two stationary bikes, and one rolling machine. Um, the existing cardiovascular equipment we have has gotten a really long life. We have a really good maintenance program that we stay on top of. So. We've gotten quite a few years out of that equipment, and we're really excited to be able to, uh, you know, bring some new equipment in there for the patrons to use. And it's always well received when we bring in new amenities. The a portable stage. This is another one that I think is really exciting. Um, we have, uh, you know, we've we've had a concert. We had a stage in front of the community center for the concerts on the green that. Is is it's another one? It's 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 at the end of its life. I think it's been at the end of its life for the past five or ten years. It's plywood and different pieces of it. Our facility services division's done a great job of keeping it up and running. Uh, but you know, we've we've always looked at and tried to see the opportunities for maybe having a portable stage at some point in time. And we've applied for a grant through the Washington Parks and Recreation Association in conjunction with the Association of Washington Cities for a, uh, the funding to purchase a portable stage. Um, if awarded, the new stage would be used for the concerts on the green 
And it would also give us the flexibility to do other park programming anywhere within our system. Um, you know, the staging is sort of that what goes on the back of a, a one ton pickup truck and it's, uh, yeah, it just opens up and you create a stage and it can be anywhere. And they're really professionally well done. You see them a lot of times at big, you know, like at uh, salmon days, you would see a lot of them on the streets and whatnot. So we're excited and we should find out in the next couple of weeks, whether or not we receive that grant and we've been meeting, we've done our research, we've studied up on the, the one we want. So. When and if we get that funding, we'll be moving forward with that purchase. Um, the Recreation Scholarship Program, I believe that this was discussed back in November on uh, 22nd with the uh, board and uh, appreciate the support for that. I don't know if you want me to continue. Like, should I cover that one? I could give a quick review for those that don't know about it, maybe? Brian, I think everyone was familiar. I, I would just, you know, Add that you and I had a chance to have a, an initial conversation with the city council last week. Very supportive. We went to council to get some additional feedback on um, some additional modifications. Council echoed the support that you all had as park board in terms of transitioning to this um, fee reduction model, allowing us to reduce fees as opposed to relying solely on um, revenues available. Uh, for scholarships, so uh, a lot of good progress by the recreation team there. Great feedback from council. We're hoping um, in February to get action on that modification. So we're ready to jump into spring summer with a, a new scholarship program. Yeah, that would be outstanding. That fee reduction model is a, a really solid model. Next, like thanks again for the support of the park board on that one. Um, the athletic field and uh, park rental procedures, sort of uh, reviewing and assessing that. Um, in 2022, we're going to be looking at, uh, you know, what, what reviewing our ball field and shelter rental practices and adjusting as needed to streamline processes for the use of our public, you know, field spaces and structures. Um, some, of the, some of the assessment items that we're going to be thinking about, you know, is, you know, how are we managing, you know, in comparison to other cities? You know, how are man how are they managing their ball fields, their shelters, their sp their uh, special event spaces? You know, how are we defining our spaces, and how are those spaces being used? Um, what does their application look like? You know, how do how are we using them? Um, how do we how do we manage field allocations? You know, how are other cities going about their distribution of fields to different entities and organizations? Um, and then reviewing policies and procedures for uh, our rented spaces. And, and comparing those with other cities, just to sort of see where we're all lining up with one another. You know, it's just a good chance to review and benchmark ourselves with how we're doing it and comparing with uh, our neighboring cities to make sure we're in alignment and then coming into alignment with best practices. So, you know, our, our goal is always to provide you know, as best service as we can to enhance our customer service and make those public spaces easier for people to use. So, I believe that covers all the recreation services topics. Lots of good stuff happening there. It does, Brian. Thanks so much. And that last item, the the athletic field and, and park rental um, assessment. Uh, thank you, Melissa Ching. She will be leading that effort and that analysis. So um, uh, thank you, Jen. Thank you, Brian. Um, lots of, as you can see, uh, key initiatives, key investments in our facilities, our parks and our services in 2022. Um, I just finished with this slide and then open it up for any questions you might have. Um, you know, of all the all the stuff we do, all the services we provide, outward facing services to this great community, it really comes down to two key things. Uh, we invest in people and we invest in public places and, and we do it through quality, dedicated staff and partners, so many community partners and nonprofit partners. Um, so um, we look forward to, to jumping into jumping into 2022. Thanks so much with that. Um, any questions, comments? I had a question. Hey, Brian, can you take down the uh, PowerPoint so we can see everyone? Absolutely. Thanks. Go ahead, Roman. Yeah, the question I had was, um, you covered quite a few of the facilities. Um, you didn't mention Tibbetts Creek Manor. I'm just wondering how that's working. The facility, and it's still in good shape and looks pretty good from the outside. Uh, Tibbetts yeah, Creek Manor. Tibbetts Creek Tibbetts Creek Manor, we are not um, operating that as a rental facility. Uh, so as part of uh, the pandemic, and as, as Brian said, some of the really, really hard uh, decisions that needed to be made, one of those was um, 
no longer operating uh, the manor as a rental facility, as an event facility. And so um, uh, that is not um, currently happening right now. Um, it is being used as some um, auxiliary space uh, for city staff as we're transitioning out of City Hall Northwest, but uh, we do not have a, a recreation staff or a recreation presence there at that at that site anymore. Okay, great, thanks. Yep. Any other questions? Hey, Ruben, I, thanks for the question, Ruben. I, I'm tempted to go back to the, that closing picture of, of one of our summer concerts. Uh, I was gonna say there's a, there's a park board member um, hidden in that in that photo and uh, i just gave it away it's it's reuben um but just oh. so appreciate reuben you're you you were there as a kwanian and uh, just that key partnership with uh those summer concerts um i was gonna i was gonna point you out but i'm not gonna do it now since the slide's no longer up was reuben dancing or he was just standing there i actually was there as a hippie i i put a wig on and a tie-dye shirt uh, look at the royal blue shirt near the speaker. I think there is some slight dancing going on. Uh, <laughs> uh, the great uh, venue to do it. <laughs> Danielle, did I see you had a question? Yeah, I have a few, a couple questions, um, mostly involving Veterans Memorial Field and sort of that that plan. Um, I, as I understand it, that field that that park has been used as a kind of a, as an athletic field and gathering community kind of gathering event space for like 100 years. Um, and so it strikes me as the, the, that the order of kind of the, the order that I would like to see at least us engage or in um, in this would be to complete the athletic field inventory first um because that will i think be critical in what we're do going to do with be able to do or need to do with tibbets and veterans memorial field um so it strikes me that we need to do the inventory first and then look at veterans memorial field and kind of do that process and that there's not an urgency to do veterans memorial field first because whatever plan we develop as I understand it, we probably don't have the funds for it at this point. Um, I mean, it could be wrong, but um, so that's, I would like to see that. I'd also like to see, um, uh, have us be more educated as a board about um, the history of Veterans Memorial Field, and perhaps we could get someone from the Historical Society to come and share some information. Um, I know I did a, I did a public records request last fall um and so i have a bit more information from my own education but i think it would be good to have that have us all on the same page um and then um oh i would really i also think um the inventory one of the things that we've learned during covid is that although we have a great relationship with the school district and we are able to use their fields and their um facilities there are times where we can't right as a community and so we had that this time um, in the last couple of years and so i think that we need to as we're doing our inventory now in my head at least mentally i have an asterisk next to that the school district facilities because you know for example um our our system our park system doesn't have any high school size baseball fields we, we always just you know, community groups are able to use the high school field, but when the high school field isn't available, there's nowhere for, uh, you know, there, we have, our, our kids have to go up to Redmond or, or another jurisdiction. So um, I just wanted to kind of keep that in mind. And then um, Jen, I would love us to be able to see the survey that goes out before like a draft survey or just kind of like go through the survey as our board before it goes out to the public, because I feel like a, a lot of times when we do the surveys, the way that we're looking at some of the questions um, and the answers that we we're looking to get, um, not that we're looking to get answers, but we might be asking a slightly different question or have a follow-up question. So I'd really appreciate it if we had a chance to take a look at those before they go out. Thanks, that was a lot, but. A lot of good points, Danielle, thanks for that. 
If I can just add before, thank you, Danielle. Great points. Really appreciate that. Um, you're absolutely right. You know, the, the, the sequencing of that work is going to be important uh, to whatever degree gets started with Veterans Memorial. It will not, will be nowhere near sort of completion or recommendations until um, that sports field assessment um, is done. And we really get a sense of, of, of needs, uh, priorities, um, opportunities for improvements. Um, your point about the school district is spot on. Uh, it's why it's really important that not only we look at the facilities themselves, but access to those facilities and how we might um, look at either through what, what are some of the existing constraints uh, to community access to some of those school district facilities and how we might um, either through agreements or, or something understand um, those public investments um, and access to those public investments are, are likely going to be really, really important uh, for a pretty land constrained community uh, to address um, athletic field needs now and, and into the future. Um, so appreciate all those points. I guess as a follow up to that, the reason I'm concerned about the timing for Veterans Memorial is that when we went through this process a couple of years ago, it was three years ago, I guess, we kind of got it started. Um, you know, when the initial proposals that came back to us um, didn't include any, <clears throat> excuse me, any actual fields, right? And I think that through the process, we ha we ended up with one that did have have a field in there, but um, and a field meaning, in my mind, being like an athletic field of some sort. Um, and so I just want to make sure we don't get too far along in the process before we know what our community needs are, and and before we understand the historical kind of like the tradition at that at that park and can decide like whether it's appropriate to deviate from that or to honor that by kind of continuing in the same the same uh you know in the in the same sort of athletic and community event kind of nature. Absolutely. As a as a play field, as a sports field. Yep. Great points. As a as a community gathering space, as I as I understand it, it has been for all this time too. Yep. Yeah. Yep. All of the above. Yep. Yeah, I really like the idea of getting maybe Erica from the historical museum uh, involved to give us a presentation when we get started with that. That would be really good. Great idea. Any other comments or questions on this agenda item? I'm um, not seeing any hands. I have a couple things. Um, Park ops manager. Is that a new position or is that a replacement of one that you just got started on last year? Uh, that's a replacement of, of someone who was on board last year, uh, but okay. the same position. Yep. And um, the Confluence Bridge, Jennifer's probably getting tired of hearing from me on this issue, but I'm, it's a good it's a good timing issue since we're going to get the Arts Commission or the Arts Department involved to do some repairs. As a part of that, there was always a an interpretive panel that was supposed to be in place, uh, I believe, to help describe the artwork, uh, the mayfly aspect and the importance of that with salmon and all of that. This would be a really good opportunity and timing to pursue that further to try and include that within the work of uh, repairs that are put on the bridge. I don't know if there's. I don't know where that's at. The artist has probably disappeared at this point. We may need to find somebody else to do it. I don't know, but. Hi, Brad. <laughs> this is Jennifer. I can gladly answer that. And you're um, asking the question is very timely because I just had this conversation two weeks ago with Amy herself. Um, we need to um, work another game plan to try and get the information from the artist, but Amy and I will work on that and do it as part of the, the bridge deck project. We Good. are going to be including that. Um, yeah, um, being artists, Good being artists yes, <laughs> you know, just hasn't been a high priority on their end, but uh, we will do what we can to get a nice descriptor up um, about the artwork. Good. Appreciate that, Jan, and Amy being Amy Duke's arts arts coordinator with the city. All right. Okay, let's uh, move on. Anybody else have any questions or comments on this one? Not seeing anything. Okay, let's move on. Oh, we got one thing. 
two, two quick things. Um, one is I'm super excited about the pool feasibility study. Um, I mean, I have a copy of it here if you need it, like the last one we did, but <laughs> hopefully we we'll, can use that as a starting point or at least, you know, thought, thought starter. Um, and then with the field, or not the field inventory, but the kind of the audit or the comparisons to other communities, um, who's going to be doing that? that the one where you're, you're going to see like where. That one. In terms of field rentals, our, our sort of our park yeah. rental field rental work, yeah. uh, Melissa will be leading that effort with our athletics team as well. In terms okay, of great. how, it's more how, how we, how we handle both field rentals, how we do park sh um, picnic shelter rentals, and in many ways, how we look at uh, general sort of community event park rentals as well. Um, okay, great. Thanks. Okay, let's move on. Our next um, agenda item is uh, talking about the uh, capital ta capital finance task force. And uh, Jeff, do you want me to kick this off or do you want to get started? I know you have something to present. Yeah, no, Brad, thanks. I, I think it'd be great for you to give an update and talk through some of the ad hoc discussions with, with Ruben and Danielle and Zach, and then um, I'm happy to give an overview of sort of what a, a park district is like we shared with the, the funding task force. Okay. So let me give you a little bit of an update where we're at here. Um, the task force got started in September. We're a little bit behind, but um, not too far. We anticipate probably three more meetings before we get to the final recommendation stage to the city council. Uh, our next meeting is uh, this Wednesday, um, and then we have two more meetings uh, uh, in February, and then that probably should be the end of it. Um, we're now kind of in the meat of it at this point in terms of recommendations on the top three priorities, uh, that being transportation, parks, and facilities. Um, I really appreciate uh, the involvement of the ad hoc team that uh, has been very helpful with discussions uh, with uh, Danielle and Ruben and Zach and myself. And I really appreciate uh, Jennifer and Jeff being uh, in our meetings as well to give a, 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 a staffing uh, aspect to it. Um, kind of our last meeting at the ad hoc team, uh, we kind of reached agreement to some extent as to what we think needs to be pursued further to look into uh, the potential for a, a metropolitan uh, Parks District as being uh, probably the uh, the best opportunity for future funding in parks. We had some discussion about um, bonds, which we've used um, uh, twice in the last two decades, uh, and that has potential again. Um, there, our last one was in 2013, so we're nearing into that nine, 10 year period of time where um, if we were going to do another bond, we now would be kind of the time to consider that again. In our ad hoc meeting, we talked about um, the need for something more long-term and sustainable because what happens with these bonds is we get a, like our last one was $10 million. We burn through that within a matter of a few years to get a number of good uh, things accomplished. Uh, but then you go several years without any funds, and um, here we are now sitting with a six-year CIP that about $27 million worth of projects is unfunded. Uh, and looking beyond that, um, in terms of future years beyond this six-year CIP, uh, there's about $102 million in unfunded projects. All of these projects actually came from the strategic plan that we developed a few years ago, which was a 20 year plan. <clears throat> and so the intention would be to actually have something in place. And this park district would be a good opportunity to have something in place for some additional funding. Perhaps over the next 20 years and beyond. Um, Jeff clarified uh, that we can actually. Uh, make it pretty specific, much like a bond in terms of uh, the various things that we would want to accomplish uh, with that funding. 
so the community would have a better understanding in terms of what those funds would be used for. Um, so in any event, that's kind of where we're at. And um, we had talked about a little, this is a little bit of nitty gritty here, I suppose, but um, it would probably be in the neighborhood of um, possibly 15 cents to 30 cents per thousand. Uh, which would be how the levy would be um, set up uh, to pay for this. And we have a lot more work to do to determine what that number would be uh, and also how the community would support it, if they would support it. Uh, if we were to get something within that range, um, in addition to um, grants, you know, that are available for a variety of projects that would actually get us real close to satisfying the unfunded uh, aspects of our parks uh, over the next 20 years. Um, so that's kind of an overview. Again, I think the ad hoc, we were all in agreement uh, that, uh, that it, it's worthy of looking further into a parks district as being uh, the, the future funding opportunity um, you know, that we've probably been uh, in need for for some time. So, so this is good time to kind of segue into Jeff, maybe talking a little more specifically about that park district. But before we do that, anybody have any questions or comments about what I just commented about? And not seeing anything, Jeff, why don't you take it from there? I will. Thanks. Thanks, Brad. And, and, uh, yeah, equally. So Ruben, Zach, uh, Danielle, thank you as well for your time. Um, um, serving on the, the ad hoc group, but uh, Brad, especially thanks for your, your willingness to jump onto the, the, the bigger task force, the capital financing task force, um, to really, I think, tackle some big questions and how this. Community wants to invest in, um, in your. Um, transportation system, your uh, parks and open space system as well. Um, Melissa, if you want to allow me to share, I will um, then jump on and, and what I'm going to do is, is quickly give, give an overview of a, a PowerPoint presentation that I shared um, to the Capital Financing Task Force uh, last fall. Let's see if I do this right. All right, I think you can all see that. Switch it to present mode and we're off and running. So I had the chance to share this, like I said, last fall. Um, this is just a quick number of pages. I'll, I'll provide an overview. It, it, I think helps to just sort of paint the picture of what a, a park district is. There's been a lot of recent uh, rule changes over the last 10 years that, that give communities really added, added flexibility for what a, a park district can do. Um, there's an RCW, RCW 35, that allows this special local taxing authority to improve, maintain, and support parks and recreation facilities um, um, immensely flexible in that um, it can be specific and support specific park funding needs uh, for, for any uh, given community that's considering this. Uh, as Brad mentioned, this is something that goes to the voters. It needs to be voter approved. Um, it becomes uh, long term and in, in some cases can be permanent, uh, a permanent funding source uh, to support a community's uh, parks um, and recreation priorities. Um, what the legislation does, um, as opposed to uh, a bond that is basically like putting money on the credit card or a levy that is uh, really just a, a limited term funding source. This creates a, a junior taxing district. Um, and that junior taxing district has, has a different set of rules uh, within um, the property tax um, limitations that the state sets. Um, senior taxing districts are uh, cities and counties. Um, and then um, any other districts, library districts, fire districts, park districts, um, fall as junior taxing districts um, under those uh, rules and limitations. Uh, thankfully, in working with the finance department as the city and the community even considers this, there's 
there's ample funding authority within those limitations um, uh, for uh, the community con to consider something like this, to consider a park district. Um, what is Issaquah's capacity? That was one of the questions of, of um, capacity sort of for earning, the rate of earning uh, based on 2021 assessed valuations uh, citywide. Um, for every 10 cents per $1,000 uh, per capita or, or um, uh, $1,000 of AV of assessed valuation, every 10 cents um, would equate to about $1.2 million annually um, in revenue. Went the wrong way, sorry. Um, some considerations uh, when thinking about um, what this option would be. And, and in some ways, this sort of sets into motion wh what is some of the continual work? What is some of the, the further engagement, the further exploration that would be needed uh, to be able to even answer um, um, what um, a park district might look like in a community like Issaquah? Um, first is obviously, what are the priorities? What's the project identification? Uh, like I said in the first slide with legislation, the legislation is immensely flexible. Um, it can pay for capital, it can pay for operational priorities, um, uh, but really sort of engaging with the community as to what the priorities are and, and, um, um, uh, and sort of the why. Uh, the boundaries of the park district are another uh, really important consideration uh, that again, uh, there's flexibility within this legislation there are a number of options that, that could be considered uh, for boundaries. Um, um, there are examples around us where the boundaries are not um, a specific city boundary, but they're um, a different compilation of a boundary. Uh, there's other examples around us, recent examples where communities went out for a park district and they used their city boundary. Um, uh, those trade-offs bring with it um, sort of a varying degree of, of, of complications because in some ways the third bullet, um, along with identifying boundaries of a district, there are uh, specific requirements within the, the legislation for governance of that park district and oversight of that park district. So in some ways this works closely with the boundaries in that you need to set up um, a district, I should say a park district needs to set up a governing body um, so if per se park district boundaries were a um, um, similar reflection of a city boundary, then the acting city council could also serve as that park board. Um, if it is a different boundary set, um, there's different rules that apply. In some cases, a whole new elected park board would need to be created. Um, uh, so do you wanna create um, sort of redundancy of governance or um, consider a, a whole new governance group for for a park district. Um, again, important important um, factors uh, that a community would any community would need to consider. Um, another key consideration, obviously, much like a bond or a levy, is is engagement, um, surveying um, around level of funding um, and timing of a public vote, since this is something that would go to. Uh, the voters and not only that engagement, but analysis of that engagement. Um, uh, the last consideration is really important um, sort of thinking beyond the vote and that's what's the relationship of the park district to other city funding uh, for parks and recreation. Um, I'll mention on the last slide, some recent models um, with the, the new um, um, legislation that's been out the last 10 years. Uh, there's some re recent models where cities, City of Seattle and City of Olympia did some important work to ensure continued investment by the city in parks and recreation, both operationally and capital, but ensuring that continued investment and seeing the district as, an, as additional investment and not supplanting um, historic funds for new park district funds, uh, but all really, really important factors to, to consider. Um, I'll go over these pretty quickly. Um, again, shared with the task force, and in some ways, and Brad knows this, the context with the task force, these are really just affirming in some ways, um, if, if the city is to consider um, something like a park district as a funding source. Uh, there's some really important next steps 
um, and a number of next steps that need to happen. Um, as I was saying on the last slide, a lot of this exploration and scoping um, would be necessary, a lot of community engagement around that. Um, once, not only those consideration questions that were in the in the previous bullets, but but either even other factors are identified. Um, if it's something that moves forward, that is a recommendation that would move forward to city council for city council action. Uh, much like a bond or a levy, once the the legislative body, in this case the city council, took action on that, um, um, that would immediately change. Um, uh, the community engagement into a campaign and, and public vote. Um, there's important um, factors of, of sort of city involvement that, that pivot, uh, that change uh, once something becomes a, a campaign similar, very similar to a bond and a levy. Um, another uh, next step would be exploring ideas, again, depending on boundary, depending on governance decisions, uh, putting in place an interlocal agreement um, that helps to establish what that governance model model looks like between uh, the city um, and this eventual park district. Um, uh, the two examples I mentioned earlier, Seattle and Olympia, um, have some terrific um, interlocal agreements uh, that uh, the city and the district entered into, again, to sort of look at long-term funding, um, ensuring the establishment um, of um, continued, I should say, continuation of existing investment that those cities are making in parks and recreation um, as a park district is informed. Um, and then another key step um, within sort of the requirements of a park district are uh, there would be um, oversight requirements um, um, and then annual reporting uh, that needs to be done um, in conjunction with that, um, with that park district. And then uh, just last slide um, identifies a couple of resources that we shared with the task force and certainly wanted to share with you tonight or anybody that might be watching this um, um, websites, uh, both for um, on the Seattle website for the Seattle Park District have some terrific uh, resources, not only for how they formed their district, but uh, now that that's been going for a while, what some of their annual re annual reporting looks like um, Olympia 2 has a website on their. A park district that was established in a in, in a similar vein uh, to Seattle, and that they they looked at um, sort of their city boundaries as um, um, as the formation of that district. And that's it. A super quick overview. So I will stop sharing if I can find the stop sharing button. There we go. It's a drop down. So questions and comments. Any hands? But he's pretty versed on park district. It looks like. Yeah. I guess my question, Jeff, would be uh, with the amount of work potentially that would be involved in putting something like this together. Um, how much of that would be staff that would be doing that versus park board? In terms of this sort of exploratory work, is that what you're asking? Well, you know, you've got exploratory work, you've got things like governance and a lot of those things, a lot of those things that you mentioned in terms of actually the administration of a park district um, beyond just actually putting it together for the campaign. Looks like there's a fair amount of work after one is in place to actually administer it. Yeah, very much so. And so that would be a, a very careful consideration is um, as, as a park district is being sort of thought up and, and voted and taken to the voters, uh, there would probably be some need for um, some type of administrative support. Again, if it's uh, depends on what the boundaries are, um, if it's boundaries that that parallel a city, then um, a lot of existing city staff um, can do both of those roles. If um, if the priorities of a park district, I'm putting a lot of ifs on this, but if the priorities of a park district are, say, um, capital investment, 
um, and, and sort of beefing up capital investment, then obviously we would want to look at um, some of those proceeds of a park district helping to uh, bring necessary project management, park planning, staff, um, administration support on that and to deliver those products. If, um, I mean, so it really varies on what the, what the focus and priority of that district funding is. If it's delivering X type of recreation programs differently or more of them, then, you know, rec the, the, the subsequent staffing uh, to support the the work that the district funding would be bringing would be a, a really important consideration um, when sort of scoping and framing up the the district. Um, in terms of the governance and administration, again, that's where that boundary decision really comes into play. If if say it's similar to a city boundary, then it you know we can learn from some of the other districts that have done it. Um, those are actions that are going to the same city council. Uh, they're they're functioning both in a city council role in terms of investments of parks and recreation services, and then there would be park district related items that would be going to that same uh, to that same city council. Um, so, if, if, we, if we form a task force within the park board to look into this further. Um, what's your vision of that in terms of the expectations and all of that? Do you have any thoughts yet so that people can give some consideration to it? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, not, not a ton, but certainly some. I think as we had this conversation with the, the financing task force, it really depends on what comes out of that recommendation. But let's say that recommendation says, hey, you know what? Further exploration of a park district is a is a priority. Then um, yeah, I I would um, I would think a broad um, sort of second task force that probably has a, a good amount of park board engagement, but also some other community members um, to to really uh, pull together a team that would um, focus pretty much solely on this question of of you know answering those park board considerations. Um, uh, doing the exploratory work and coming up with a recommendation. So, um, I think a mix of park board and maybe you know other other key community members who might be interested to probably endeavor on um, several months, if if not a year of 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 work to do um, to do that. Uh, that would probably look very much like um, historically what the city's done for any sort of bond um, exploratory work, bond or levy work. Okay, thanks. We'll get into that more as we get down to it. Chris, you had something? Yeah, there. Sorry, couldn't get the uh, mute button. Uh, Jeff, so you mentioned Seattle and Olympia as examples, um, and, and there are others, like is it Mount Sai and uh, Metro Parks Tacoma, correct? Correct. And, and are some let's say more exemplary than others in, in you know, in providing better models than others maybe. And then the other question is, is there data uh, for you know, how much funding are they able to, to provide that they wouldn't have been able to provide uh, in, in basically a board for formation? Yeah, great question, Chris. So yeah, I, um, yes, you're right. There are other models. Uh, Metro Parks Tacoma is probably the longest established park district in the state. Um, I, I, I worked for them in the 90s. So as a former employee, they were, I think, established in 1907. Um, Point Defiance Park, Ruston Way, it, it, they are very much a, I think what you would think of pre some of this new legislation, very much a, a separate agency. They have their own um, elected um, park board, uh, board of commissioners, uh, their own IT department, their own. I mean, so they're a very much a separate governmental agency. Uh, so I think a very different model than um, a very effective, but um, um, very much a, a new governmental agency. The Sideview Park District. Um, was formed really out of uh, 2003. Um, if you remember, those of you that might be around when King County Parks was rapidly getting out of the 
um, local parks, ball field, and swimming pool business. Um, um, a number of cities were, were gifted uh, parks or pools and asked here, what are you gonna do with it? The Sideview District was really formed out of that crisis. Um, and there was a pool, the, pool, the Sideview pool uh, was really under threat of closure. And so the formation of that district, um, really that was its or origin story. Uh, they now uh, provide um, more services, but their boundary um, is not congruent to a city. Uh, so uh, um, I wouldn't say it's inefficient. I think they're very effective at what they do, uh, but it's, a, I think, a different model and was formed, um, I want to say, during just out of the Great Recession, so probably 2010, some of this new legislation came about that really gave cities the ability to consider a park district as not thinking of it as a whole new government entity, but a way to um, augment um, investments that cities are making. And so um, not to say Seattle or Olympia are any better, they're just, they're probably examples that came out of this new legislation. Um, Seattle, I believe their tax rate is about 25 cents, 28 cents per 1,000. Um, in terms of what their park district yield is. I don't know, I'd, I'd have to look at an annual report to see what that augments. Um, uh, they made it pretty clear in their interlocal agreement. If you take a look at that, the city of Seattle's, you know, support at the time in 2014 of both operational and capital investments in parks and recreation needed to remain um, as this new funding, um, again, became that additive. Um, Olympia, I believe, is right around a quarter as well, 25 cents uh, per 1,000. Thank you. You bet. Uh, Danielle. Sort of as a follow-up to that, um, I mean, I think there's also the new Penn Met um, Park District down in Gig Harbor, and which to me is, you know, perhaps as something else that we could look at in exploring this because the city of Gig Harbor, like the city of Issaquah, is a very small geographic area, but serves like, you know, much larger, there's a much larger community um, in the unincorporated area. And so I think, you know, we were somewhat in between that model and like city of Seattle, where there's clear overlap and boundaries. Yeah, that's a great point. Another good example. And I think in that case, and we can do more research, I I think the city of Gig Harbor is not part of the Penn Met district. The Penn Met district is sort of the surrounding unincorporated. Unincorporated, unincorporated Pierce County area. Yep. Okay. Any other comments or questions on this item? I wanted to bring it tonight because uh, we will probably have everything wrapped up uh, with the task force likely uh, before our next board meeting at the end of February. So uh, if you had some additional comments, um, this is a good time to make them. I, just, um, I wanna say like, I, I'm pretty excited about this, you know, opportunity to explore this, you know, new funding opportunity. Um, it's much more sustainable than what we've done in the past. Um, and and will give us, you know, if it if it works, um, it'll give us a predictable amount of, you know, of funds to really plan for um, so we can do something like a, a master plan and then know that we can actually implement that master plan in a few years rather than, you know, doing a great master plan and then saying like, well, we don't actually have the money for that. So, um, you know, hopefully we have, well, I know we have a great track record with our bonds and how much we've been able to leverage with those and, um, you know, successfully complete those projects. So I'm hopeful that we'll have, um, if this is the avenue that the city wants to do, that we'll have good support behind that. Yeah, and I think it's a good timing too, because I think that in the past, the city, you know, has been served relatively well by bonds, but the city was also much smaller. It's grown a lot. <clears throat> and now the park district concept could be distributed, um, um, you know, or, or the cost of it distributed amongst a much larger 
tax base to some extent because of the population growth that's occurred uh, in this city over the last 20 years. So I think, and as the expectation of continued growth from here on is expected to be, you know, I don't know, 50,000 people here, you know, within 10 years or whatever, um, you know, now's the time to really consider doing something more sustainable. So I, I'm really behind this as, as well. And the task force, frankly, uh, from other people on it seem to be very supportive of the idea as well. Everybody was kind of wishing that, you know, that there was these type of funding opportunities available for some of the other concerns that we're having for uh, infrastructure. Um, you know, so this is a unique opportunity available to parks. And so I, I'm really excited to see what it looks like. Something more, Danielle? Yeah, just with respect to timing, I know I've mentioned this in our ad hoc um, group, but I, I think that the timing of this is going to be really critical to like move forward with some urgency because, as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, under our traditional kind of the way that we would fund projects, we would have already had a park bond like in place or like coming up. So, because um, we did one, I think in like 2006, I think something like that, and you know, we're, we're like, we would be due, due for another one. So I think there will be some urgency to sort of figure this out and then hopefully, you know, move forward expeditiously. Agreed. That's my hope. You know, there's lots of, uh, lots of moving parts and lots of uh, people pushing in different directions. So it's a matter of uh, compromise uh, and, and um, diplomacy to try and Get the timing in place, uh, but I mean, it's going to take, you know, a, a year or 2 to probably put all this together to some extent before it could go into a ballot measure anyway. So, I mean, ideally, the sooner we get started with that, the better. So that maybe in a couple years, we could actually potentially see some funding. Any other comments. Questions. Good, thanks. We'll conclude that part. Next item on the agenda is the uh, Newport Way um, infrastructure development and letter that was proposed by John from the engineering department. Uh, we've looked at this letter before, uh, but he has actually updated that letter, which is uh, now uh, what you have attached to your packet this evening. I assume everybody has had an opportunity to review it. Uh, it, I have reviewed it. It's pretty much in line with the combined um, meeting that we had with the transportation advisory board. Um, I've had some further discussion with the transportation advisory board uh, chair. Uh, she and I did not feel a need to have any additional meetings about this. Um, we have sections at, towards the end of that letter to add a few additional comments that aren't maybe already incorporated within the letter. Uh, I drafted up something pretty simple um, to put there for now and uh, just wanted to get everybody's opinion. Um, if there's any additional comments you would like to have included in that, uh, now's the time to make mention of that and I can include that before I send it off to uh, the engineering uh, department. Um, so that being said, Danielle. Um, I guess I don't have any issue with the actual letter. I just feel that um because there wasn't that this is a case sometimes you have a case where you know people have different opinions about something um because what you're really trying to do is is you know at the end of the day not everyone's going to be happy so you you kind of like are giving up on things so i feel like this was a discussion where people had pretty consistent like our group and the transportation group like had pretty consistent like goals and objectives um, with respect to safety and and whatnot. But the fact that we weren't really able to come to consensus as to the right, like as to one plan sort of means to me that, um, that there's not, you know, like a, a lot of satisfaction about what the options were. 
so that we were wanting something different, right? And then people kind of came, you know, compromised because there wasn't like the the option that we really wanted. So I don't really know what to do with that, but I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, I feel like there are, you know, different approaches that other cities are doing um, with respect to bike lanes and moving moving bikes with traffic. Um, you know, that weren't presented to us as an option. And I understand there are some reasons why, but to me, I, I would have, I, I would have liked to see us, you know, go back out and think about it some more. Well, and I agree. I think to some extent, you know, the safety issue really hinged a lot around uh, separation of pedestrians and bikes. I mean, we have that same problem with trails, you know, and um, I remember we had a fair amount of discussion about what we were going to do at Park Point, frankly, when we developed the trail system up there about how to make that safer. And that seems to have been functioning over the years. Um, I think space is a bit of an issue that, that that they may have some limitations to be able to create a, a fully separate, um, you know, kind of bike lane. Um, I don't know. I think we have voiced our concerns enough to them to, to say, hey, you know, that, that's an issue, to, you know, not only safety with traffic, but safety between bikes and pedestrians. And it's really kind of out of our hands in terms of if they can come up with something additional beyond what they've already presented I, you know I, I i agree it'd been nice to have had consensus but um you know we were close i mean we we i think we were 57 percent or something the park board you know put on that plan b which was to kind of have a separate path versus kind of a combined path sidewalk thing and um so I don't know. I, I think it, I think that you know John's going to have some rehashing to think about this. You know, in terms of whether or not we see any anything else as a potential option, I kind of doubt that will happen. We'll see. I mean, I, and that I could, and maybe that's something to add to our part of it. Is that because of that being a you know a focus is is there. Is there further consideration that the engineering department can come up with as additional options to provide that kind of separation? Because I, I, I don't know. I, I think you know, electric bikes and electric off-road vehicles to you know is is a danger zone. You know, to be putting those in the same proximity as pedestrians, and it certainly would be nice to find a way to have those separated. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else um, has been to like um, the street next to Climate Fudge Arena, um, but there are, you know, they're basically retrofitting some of the streets in the Queen Anne area um, to to have bike lanes, and so they've taken away like the parking strip, and and that is a two-way um, bike lane with a you know, a separation from the street, but not like a big, huge planting area, right? But it, it, there is a, so it's very clear that the bikes are supposed to be on the street, but they're not, they are separated from the cars. And so it just seems like, you know, you, now that I'm like thinking about this and looking at it, you know, you come across some different ideas um, that seem like they could work, you know, so. And anyway. now on that example, they're not mixing that with pedestrians, right? They're mixing that with traffic, right? Yeah, they they just took a a, a parking lane, um, so it's like a you know it's on the street underneath the curb. So there's a sidewalk. The parking lane has been converted to a two lane. It's painted green, two way bike lane, um, and then there's a herb type, you know, there's a, a barrier right along the street um, to keep the bike separate separate from the, the cars. So I know one of the constraints on in our area was, um, you know, like if they were going to have a separation, they wanted to have kind of a big separation and that was going to like stretch the road too wide and, you know, be, you know, cost prohibitive. But anyway, I've taken up too much time on this, but any other comments about 
the letter or anything additional that you'd like to have added? If not, um, could I have a, a motion to um, for the park board to approve this letter so I can get this back to engineering? Someone? <laughs> Chris? I move that we approve the letter regarding the uh, bike lane and pedestrian lane configuration. Uh, anybody like to second that? I'll second. Thank you, Ruben. Any further discussion about this before we say yay or nay? If not, um, everybody that's uh, in approval of the motion, please uh, give me a thumbs up. I see that's uh, from everybody. Okay, thank you. That's approved. I'll um, I'll add a little little extra sentence on what I've already done to kind of discuss what you just mentioned. Danielle, to see if there is something more that they can do. Okay, good. Thanks. I appreciate that. I'll get it sent off here this week. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that. So, that leaves us uh, good. We're a little bit ahead of time. And uh, looks like we're now back to Jeff for his director's report. All right, thanks, Brad. And thank you, everybody. I, I really do appreciate the, the work you did and, and, and really the opportunity you had as a park board to uh, lend at least voice to um, those right of way considerations um, and looking at, at trail connectivity. And um, um, yeah, just appreciate your work on that. I know Jennifer, um, we'll continue to be working with uh, John closely on that uh, on that project and what design looks like ultimately. And and um, certainly your your voice has been uh, very important in that. And um, I think we'll continue to be as that moves forward. Uh, I've just got a couple of items really really fast, and I want to certainly make sure there's ample time to hear from Ryan and Sean, um, and certainly Brad as well. But uh, Ryan and, and Sean for for certain. Um, I mentioned to Brenda before we came on, boy, we turned the calendar to 2022 and it kind of feels like it's been of a bit of a blur for our department between snow and ice right after the holidays and responding to that to immediately uh, all that snow and ice, ice thaws and um, um, flood threats and, and some of our impacts to our open space system and, and services in that regard, uh, tack on Omicron, um, impacts and um, I would just say, um, not to sound all Eeyore, but uh, we're a really, really tired department and and uh, something we're paying very, very close attention to. Um, we've had a, a, a staff and a team, be it park maintenance, be it our recreation staff, be it really any, any of our groups uh, within this outward facing department that have been going hard for two years and um, we're tired. Um, the group it continues to do an amazing job as as Omicron has impacts um, uh, to our service delivery as well as our staffing. We've uh, continued to be able to operate um, um, with some modifications. Uh, we remain hopeful um, uh, that as the community remains smart and safe, we start to see those Omicron numbers go down in the coming weeks. Uh, that will uh, be um, uh, a, a real positive, not only uh, um, for for various public health reasons, but I, I think for our team as well. And and so I, I say this not to say woe is us, but really to give context and give kudos to uh, the staff in this department who uh, who continue have continued to keep their eye on the ball, and that's serving the public, making sure there's access to parks and recreation facilities throughout a global pandemic. 
um, and and at the same time keeping um, ourselves and keeping the community safe. And so, um, just a, a great work by a um, a tired team. Uh, the last item I have, yeah, thank you, Chris. Again, just kudos to the to the team. Um, just a, a reminder as we're heading into January, here comes February before we know it, there'll be another round of board commission um, applications. Uh, that, that open process starts in February. Um, given a number of terms that are up with the park board, um, I did, it's something Brad and I have certainly been discussing. I had a chance to reach out uh, to the mayor a couple of weeks ago and just um, get her sense um, as we head into 2022 with with those number of positions. Um, just to, I guess, communicate her priorities. Um, uh, she is certainly, and I think this is something that came up last year, um, is looking for ways through all boards and commissions to encourage um, some degree of transition and some degree of term turnover. Um, she is not does not have hard and fast term limits. Um, her interest in transition and turnover, uh, she wants to make sure that doesn't get in the way of um, uh, the sort of at the expense of an important board function. Um, uh, so um, all of those are really, really important considerations. As you know, the application process um, as staff and um, ongoing park board members um, do the interview process. Those recommendations are then provided to the mayor's office um, who then makes uh, recommendations that go to city council. Um, those of you that have a term up um, uh, this year, I, I understand you may have questions. Uh, the mayor was, um, is very open and and wanted to make sure that I shared with all of you that um, should you have questions or want to sort of talk with her um, directly as you might be considering reapplying to please reach out to her. She would she would love and and very much invite those uh, those conversations that you might have. So um, just wanted to share that all with you. Uh, that's all I have, Brad. Thanks. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I have just a couple things for chair report. Um, a couple encouraging things. So it's always good to have that to end our meeting. Uh, one thing I, don't, I assume everybody's real familiar with the Sequoia Alps Trails Club, but I just learned here just a few days ago that we have a new uh, executive director that's now going to be coming on board, uh, Paul Winterstein. For all of you that might know, Paul um, is a very active leader in the community, was uh, on the city council for a number of years, um, was the council president uh, chair for a number of years. Um, so it's gonna be a great addition to the Issaquah Alps Trails Club to actually have his leadership uh, skills um, and passion for the community and our trail system uh, to be leading the show on that. So uh, welcome Paul whenever you get a chance uh, to do that and uh, I'm sure you appreciate it. A uh, little update from the Kokanee work group. Um, I'll know more in a couple of days because we have another meeting coming up this week. Um, but the only thing I kind of wanted to share with you is a little good news about some recovery of Kokanee. Uh, as you know, I've been voicing for years now, you know, the problems that we've had uh, with Kokanee and the potential extinction in the Lake Sammamish watershed. Uh, we've had the last few years have uh, been numbers have been very low, like 2018, uh, you know, that type of thing. Uh, this year, the counts uh, are at 2000 so far. Wow. So that's a very encouraging news to actually see uh, that, uh, that there's uh, some improvement in, in terms of Kokanee cop population and there'll be more counts uh, to come. We don't have a final count for the year uh, yet. Um, but in any event, and it's not certain as to what we'll never probably really know um, specifically. It's really a combination of things, um, you know, that it probably led to that. But it's just certainly good news. One of the encouraging pieces is I don't know how many of you are familiar with Zaku's Creek. It's actually up towards the Redmond area on the uh, east side of the lake. Um, Zaku's Creek has a pretty substantial historical element to it with the Snoqualmie tribe. 
Uh, Zach Use Creek actually uh, some substantial work occurred on it um, over the last several years. Lakes, uh, the city of Sammamish uh, invested in quite a bit of infrastructure money into uh, culverts and that type of thing. The Snoqualmie tribe and a group of people have actually come in and done a number of restoration. Uh, and happy to report that uh, there's actually Kokanee actually in Zach Hughes Creek this year, uh, which is the first time in 40 years actually that that's occurred. So that's really a good example as to what can happen with organizations and community members coming together to actually do restoration projects to uh, improve the environment. And so I just kind of want to throw that out there as a real uh, encouragement for our kokanee. Um, Jeff already mentioned board applications coming in February, so be on the lookout for that. I think that the applications haven't been posted yet, but they normally are due by about the 25th of February. So I encourage everybody that's coming up at the end of their term to uh, to apply if you would like to continue on. Uh, and the last thing is uh, just a reminder, if you're ever going to be absent for a board meeting to please let uh, Melissa and I know beforehand uh, by email uh, so that we can have a good understanding as to how many people might not be present. The main, really the main reason for that is we need to make sure that we always have a quorum. Uh, and so if we have a bunch of people that are kind of no shows, we'd have to probably maybe reset a meeting or something that really hasn't happened to us but i just want a little friendly reminder to uh, let melissa and i know if you're not going to be able to attend so that's it for my chair report and we have lots of time remaining so that ryan and sean are not feeling like they're left out and only have a minute to tell us anything so thank you ryan and sean for uh, for joining us again this evening and uh, it's it's your show now. What would you like to tell us? Thank you for having us, Brad. We always love sharing what Yab is up to. Sean, do you want to start and I can follow up? Yeah, sure. Um, so we still have six project groups, I believe, that are still going on. Um, and we are having a meeting tomorrow to meet. Um, unfortunately, I think we've all transition to virtual for the month of January and February. That is our guidance because of new COVID um, sort of related issues. And plus we have like younger kids might not be fully vaccinated. Um, but what I can say is that the project team that I'm um, a part of, which is Harry Potter night, a community event um, is being planned and ready to go. Um, we have scheduled it for February 11th. So if there are any kids from, um, uh, I believe, elementary school, um, like third to fifth grade that you can advertise to, that is a great demographic. We're look always looking for more people to join us. Um, and it's just going to be community building. But yeah, that's the one success story I have. I'm not sure what Ryan has to say, but I'll hand it off to him. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, so I guess I'll just provide some updates on sort of the other major projects that are in the works right now. Um, another event that's um, being planned is a movie night, and so that group I know is currently working on finding out a space that they can use um, to host some sort of movie night for high schoolers. Um, we've considered doing it at the pool or the community center. Um, and then really the other major thing that is being worked on is State of Mind, which is our uh, annual mental health conference. I don't know the date for that off the top of my head. It's probably in the next uh, couple of months. But um, I know they're working on getting speakers for various topics, um, and that's always a really great event. Um, it's really informational, really informative. Uh, definitely some inspiring stories um, that come out of it as well. Um, something else that we're working on as sort of the community service part of things is uh, collaborating with the senior center to make some cards for their patrons. Uh, that's just a really exciting way that we're really hoping to get back into doing our community service work since. Uh, we put that a bit on hold over the last couple of years because of COVID. So we're looking forward to uh, coming together to work on that project. Um, and on a personal note, I'm really excited to see that recreation basketball is up and running. I have been working as a vaccination card checker the last couple of weeks, and it's been great to just see how many people are participating, the magnitude of people that come through those doors. 
uh, it's really exciting and it's been great to see all the kids um you know be really happy about getting together in their teams uh, and playing some basketball out there so i think that's all we've got well thank you for that ryan and sean appreciate it uh go ahead ruben you got something yeah i just wondering um if you guys ever do any coordination with the other clubs i was thinking some of the things you're doing might overlap quite well with the key club so just th just a thought yeah, we've definitely i know in the past that there we've definitely like used key clubs as a way to promote events so yeah i think sean and i can definitely bring that back in terms of uh continuing to collaborate with key clubs Thank yeah, you for like, that. The key club has a pretty good membership this year. But I counted 75 people at the first meeting. So it's a pretty good number. Yeah. And just as a reminder, Ryan, you're going to, are you graduating this year? John and I are both graduating, this, both year, graduating so this year. I will stick around as long as I can before I move out. <laughs> so uh, that means you're done by what, May or June then? Yeah, probably. Mm -hmm. So do you have anybody within the youth board uh, that can join us uh, after you two leave us? I'm sure we can find someone. We will definitely work on promoting and, and finding someone to fill in. Uh, I know that, you know, I know that you all value hearing from us. And so I definitely want to make sure that there is still someone here in the future. So Sean and I will definitely work on promoting that as an opportunity. Um, we know there's a lot of students who really enjoy serving on the boards and commissions, and it's a really unique opportunity that youth advisory board has. So, uh, we will definitely work on figuring that out by the end of the year. Good. Thanks. Just wanted to throw that out there to give you plenty of time to get working on that. <laughs> okay. Uh, other business announcements. Anybody have anything? Uh, Jeff, you got something? Just a quick one, Brad. I, I think in the midst of of Omicron and the uncertainties, uh, though I haven't gotten a definitive date, um, I, I like to be optimistic, and I'm hoping by sometime this spring we will be back to um, in person. Uh, it would be great to see all of you again. Um, I know. Uh, I think our one in person um, meeting we had at Hillside Park was uh, both energetic, great engagement with the neighborhood, but it was also great to see all of you. So. Um, just, I, I guess I wanted to share that optimistic hope and, um, uh, again, along the lines of what I was saying about the team, um, you know, it's been 2 years of a pandemic and, and something we've shared, a, and I think are trying to support each other as a team. I just want to pass it on to all of you. Um, and not to try and sound too preachy, but sometimes it, it feels darkest just before the dawn and, and I'm hoping we're on the tail end of this. I think we all are. Um, if you're like us, you're, you're probably super tired. And so just find ways to connect, uh, to, to your family, to your loved ones, get out and recreate. Um, we're going to, we're going to get through this. We are going to get through this. So, uh, and I just appreciate all of your interest and involvement and support of, uh, of the city and being on the park board. So thanks a ton. I'll second that. And, um, you know, if nothing else, I, one of the things that came from last year, I think it's a good idea for us to have um, maybe some meetings in parks, you know, and, and if we have limitations, maybe that's one of our way of dealing around that to some extent. Or at least when the weather gets better, I don't know, 35 degrees in the fog isn't exactly what I'm thinking, but um, Danielle, you got something? I just have a, a question for you. Um for I guess Jeff, um, with all the the rain and flooding that we had, um, I saw some pretty crazy pictures of the creek and Confluence Park. And I'm just wondering, um, I know that park is intended to flood. Um, and I'm just wondering if that if it did as it was expected or if there was damage. And also I'm curious if there was any flooding at Tibbet. Thanks, Danielle. No, no flooding at Tibbetts as we monitored that through monitored that throughout uh, Tibbetts Creek um, did well uh, with the capacity. Uh, you're right uh, confluence with the East fork and the main stem. Uh, we saw a little bit um, it performed as expected in that the sort of the northern part of the park and the what's called the oxbow is sort of the 1st point of, of floodplain relief. That's where we saw a little bit um, of flooding. Wasn't anything near the, if you remember the 2020 event, just before the, the pandemic, we actually saw a little bit more. 
but in both cases, it functioned as expected. Uh, the park ops crew has already uh, sort of made a note. There's a little bit of gravel trail repair work on that that north side of the park, but it it actually uh, performed quite well. Great, thank you so much. And that's great news about Tibbet. Anything else, anyone? Well, if not, thank you all for joining us this evening, and we'll see you again uh, next month. So uh, have a good evening. Good night. Well, good evening, all. Meetings adjourned. Bye. Thank you.